Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I was just going to kind of talk uh, informally like this. I haven't got a presentation or anything like that. And I was going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion because it would be really good to, to get some interaction going with you. I was just saying to Karen at the start that we do quite a bit of engagement with, with companies, including with banks, and we tend to talk to you know, perhaps people on your board or in corporate responsibility areas, but we don't often get the chance to talk to people in the coalface, so it would be really good to get some feedback actually on the kind of thinking that we have on ethics in banking. But just to introduce myself, so my name is Edward Mason. I'm the secretary to the Church of England's Ethical Investment Advisory Group. And this is the group that advises the national investing bodies of the Church of England on ethical investment issues. So, uh, as we were saying before, the, the setup is um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. There are three Church of England investing bodies. The largest of those is the Church Commissioners. They have the most money. They manage the historic endowment of the Church of England. So that's uh, just over £5 billion. Uh, and that helps fund the, uh, the running costs of the church and also meet historic pension liabilities. We've also got a newer uh, funded pension scheme, which is now running at about £1.2 billion. And then there's a suite of funds that individual parts of the church can invest in. So that could be a parish or a diocese or a church charity or school or something with its investment money. Uh, and there's a fund manager in the city that's, that's owned by its investors uh, and they run this suite of funds called the CBF, Church of England Funds. So altogether there are over £8 billion uh, of assets managed against this common ethical investment framework. Uh, so we're quite we're quite large institutional investors. The church commissioners are the second largest charity investors in the UK. Uh, and clearly it's very important to us that we take ethics very seriously and we integrate ethics into how we go about our investment practice. So we have this ethical investment advisory group and it's set up um, so that it fulfills a number of functions. It's, it's set up so it's independent, uh, so it's expert, uh, so it uh, is, is kind of uh, able to, to work with the investing bodies in terms of their uh, investment context. Um, so in terms of its independence, uh, only non-executive members of the group can vote. Uh, and we have an external chairman that we recruit externally. Uh, in, in terms of expertise, uh, we have a really wide range of people on the group. So the chairman is a former uh, city lawyer who was a partner at Slaughter and May. Uh, we've got uh, a former chief executive of a FTSE 100 business. Um, uh, that's Richard Harvey, who used to be chief executive of Aviva. Uh, and then on the kind of theological side, we've got a bishop. Uh, we've got the professor of biblical interpretation from King's College London, uh, Professor Richard Burridge. So we've got a really wide range of expertise from the theological and the ethical to people who've kind of you know lived with these uh, ethical issues in in business and investment and the group's also designed so that it reflects opinion within the church of england so we have uh, people representing the archbishop's council the general synod of the church which is like the church's parliament and also its mission and public affairs angle and then finally, we have uh, trustees of each of the investing bodies. They each nominate one trustee who's a voting member of the group. So it's quite a carefully crafted group so that it can give independent, expert ethical investment advice, but also the kind of advice that, that can actually be implemented in the practical fiduciary context of the investing bodies. So what I, what I thought I would do in terms of talking today was... Um, to introduce us and, and our approach to ethics, I was, I was then going to move on to talk about how we approach ethics in uh, the financial services industry as a whole, um, and then to, to put together some thoughts on uh, you know, what we think uh, might be done to put finance on a sounder ethical footing. Uh, and as you might imagine, it's something we've been giving quite a bit of thought to uh, in recent years. It's been a real priority for us in terms of our ethical investment thinking. So just to, to talk about our approach to uh, ethics, um, we, we have the Ethical Investment Advisory Group and it's supported by a secretariat. So I'm the, I'm the head of its secretariat um, and uh, I have a colleague who works on engagement with companies and proxy voting uh, in the um, 
uh, for the investments that we hold. So the, our, our ethical investment practice covers a number of, uh, of areas. We have a range of policies that are applied to uh, the investments. <coughs> they detail the kind of exclusions that we have, so you know, not investing in tobacco, um, armaments, pornography um, and, and things like that that we think it's inappropriate to devote our capital to and, and derive revenue from. But over recent years we've um, much more uh, moved towards doing things on the positive side as well in terms of engaging with the companies that we invest in, seeking to have a positive ethical impact there, exercising our stewardship responsibilities, voting uh, in-house all our um, shareholdings um, and um, you know, engaging on issues like executive remuneration through, uh, through proxy voting. We've, we've also found that the investments of the investing bodies are a lot more complicated. So uh, they invest in a very wide range of asset classes. So we also have um, ethical investment policies relating to specific asset classes. I did a lot of work a couple of years ago developing an ethical investment policy for hedge funds, uh, which was quite a piece of work, lots of different issues to think about there. And we tried to think about all the different ethical issues that may be associated with different kinds of hedge fund strategies, from ones dealing in commodities to ones involving short selling to ones involving kind of um, merger arbitrage and so on, and what the particular ethical issues were that might arise and how we might handle them as an ethical investor, what kind of strategies would be suitable for us, what kind of strategies and managers wouldn't be. So our, our, our approach to ethics is um, is very much kind of grounded in our in our values as a church, uh, theologically, found, uh, theologically grounded, um, and reflecting the values of the the beneficiaries of the funds. Um, so to to give you an example of that, uh, maybe talk about our defence investments policy. So we're, we're not um, against kind of defence uh, per se. Um, the Church of England accepts just war theology, that war may be justified in certain circumstances. Um, but then we have to confront the arms industry as it is, that it's a global industry, that arms are exported. Uh, even with governments like the UK and the US, you don't know that armaments are going to be used in a just war context. Um, and there's also a, an ethical discomfort about investing in companies that are making products that are purposefully designed to kill. So what we do there is we set a threshold of um, a kind of exposure to defence uh, equipment that we're, we're, we're sort of able to tolerate, which is 10% of revenues. Uh, it means that we don't invest in, in the major arms companies, but we will have some exposure typically to companies that are having some kind of, uh, sort of involvement in the supply chain or providing services um, in the defence industry. But we specifically implement just war theology, which um, uh, says that it's very important that warfare should be able to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. So you shouldn't use weaponry that can't discriminate against civilians. So we have a particularly strict approach to nuclear weapons, cluster munitions and landmines because those are indiscriminate weapons. So we want no uh, exposure whatsoever to them and we have a zero tolerance, 0% threshold there. So I hope that gives you an indication of kind of how we go about making our policies. They can be quite, quite sophisticated and they're, they're kind of very much designed to try and reflect uh, Anglican views on ethical issues. And none of these issues are, are easy or black and white. So uh, as I say, it's not just a question of saying that defence is bad, we don't want anything to do with it. Um, you know, our policies are, are generally like this. We, we look at issues in the round. Uh, we look at uh, different arguments, different ways of, of analysing things ethically. Um, and it's often not that there's something kind of per se wrong with a practice, like whether that's genetic modification or, or short selling, um, but it's about um, you know, how it's done, uh, whether it's done responsibly or not, the kind of intention uh, that, it's, that it's done with. It's an interesting world for the church because it's kind of it's an area where you know we really engage with with the economy, with business. Um, you know, we're actually owners of companies, so in a sense, it's kind of you know it's an area where we we, we get our hands dirty in a way, uh, and you know we 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 engage um, with with the businesses that we invest in. Um, 
and we, we, you know, we very much focus our engagement activities on uh, areas of business that are quite high impact, like uh, mining, for example, where again, you know, we're, we're supportive as, of mining as an activity, kind of delivers the raw materials for the products that we all depend upon, but at the same time it can have huge environmental impact, impact on communities as well. So we talk to companies about how responsibly they go about that. And if we have a company that we have uh, really serious concerns about in terms of how it's approaching these issues, uh, and we don't think it's taking them uh, seriously, uh, we're not getting anywhere when we're talking to them, we do have the ability to, to divest from a company and put it on our, our list of uh, banned companies that the investing bodies uh, shouldn't invest in. And we had an instance like that recently with a, a mining company called Vedanta Resources, a FTSE 100 listed company um, with most of their operations in India. A uh, lot of NGO concern about them, concern within the church about them. I went out to, to visit um, the most controversial site, had a look at it, saw what the company was saying, was shown around by an NGO, um, taken to some of the villages around the, the refining site. Uh, uh, and we weren't happy, we weren't happy with the responses we were getting from the company and we ended up uh, divesting from that company, um, which has had quite an impact actually. It affected the company reputationally. Um, and affected the, the kind of banking approach to it. Uh, the, the company, um, I don't know if you know, but it, it bought out uh, Cairn uh, in India, needed to raise a lot of finance. Uh, found that quite difficult because of its reputational problems. The banks were finding it difficult to lend to it because it was reputationally hot. Uh, Standard Chartered, uh, before lending to it, insisted that it uh, had an independent review of its sustainability practice. Uh, and they agreed to abide by its recommendations in advance and also agreed to regular uh, follow-up uh, by these consultants to see that they were implementing the policies. So um, it's kind of area where, where we can have impact as an ethical investor. Anyway, so enough of the general stuff. That's, that's kind of us generally and, uh, and, and what we do. But uh, you're probably most interested in, in terms of what uh, we think about banking. Uh, and the first thing that you might, be, you might be glad to hear is that basically we think banks are a good thing. Uh, that's probably not something that you hear very much these days, but uh, you, know, you can stand proud and, and say to your friends and family that you are a banker. Um, banking is, you know, is a socially useful activity, or it, or it should be. Uh, it performs you know, an essential function in society and the economy, uh, taking excess savings, putting them to productive use. Uh, that's a good thing. It, provides essential products to consumers like mortgages that enable them to, to, to buy things they need when they don't have the finance uh, immediately available. Uh, it supports corporate activity, um, whether that's raising finance through debt finance or, or equity, uh, transactions like mergers uh, and acquisitions. So even investment banks uh, can be good uh, as well. They're performing uh, a useful function in the economy in terms of supporting corporate <coughs> activity. Um, and also kind of supporting markets, you know, market making and so on. These are all uh, useful functions, providing payment systems. Banking is, uh, is, is an important thing uh, and it's something that uh, we are supportive of as ethical investors. Now there's going to be a but, isn't there? Um, and as I say, we've given a lot of thought um, to this and you know, it's our view that, that in recent years, banking has, has seriously lost its way. Um, and there are, you know, there have been many manifestations of this. Uh, one of them is, is over lending. Um, and, you know, you see that in terms of, um, you know, subprime lending, for example, lending money to, to people who, who don't have the, the capacity to, to pay it back and not properly uh, evaluating that. Mis-selling, of course, uh, has been a, a huge uh, issue um, and a really, a really disturbing one for us. Um, and I think, you know, to be quite frank, there's, you know, there has been greed as well, both at a, at a corporate level and in, in terms of individuals and their remuneration. But a, a, a seeking of, of profit um, without kind of regard for the consequences and the social context. Um, and kind of you know looking for, for personal remuneration again without looking at the, the wider context. 
And I think I mean, one of the most disturbing things that we've seen has been uh, kind of disregard um, and even on occasions contempt uh, for, for clients. Um, I, I remember reading um, an article in the FT uh, about, this was about sort of CDOs and, and investment banks, so uh, you know, not so much about kind of retail banking that you're involved in. But, you know, I mean, some of the things that, that went on were, um, you know, I think really quite shocking from an ethical point of view. Uh, um, you know, banks, uh, you know, creating... Uh, uh, packages of loans, uh, CDOs that, that, that they were doing it specifically for themselves to short or for or for other clients to, to short, but selling them on to uh, to investors. And you know, Goldman Sachs, as you probably know, was was fined for an instance of that kind. Um, and there was an instance of UBS uh, mentioned in, in one of these articles that it it created a CDO in in 2007 when the U.S. property market. Was, uh, was actually not just at its peak, but it was already uh, turning. And UBS staff themselves referred to the products uh, in emails as vomit and crap, uh, you know, and, and they were selling those. Um, and I think you know, anyone is going to be disturbed about you know, parts of an industry that have, that have got to, to those kinds of, kind of depths. And I think you know, one of the things that we've seen has been uh, just a kind of really detachment and a loss of ethical... Purpose. I mean, you've, you've probably read the same stuff that, that we've read about, uh, you know, the LIBOR manipulation, and you know, you'll, you'll probably recognise this quote. But I think again, it's just the kind of, just the, the lack of ethics that, you know, I think we in the church and, and kind of people outside just find kind of utterly, utterly shocking. Um, a trader uh, talking to a, a Barclays trader asking for a lower LIBOR submission. If it comes in unchanged, I'm a dead man. Barclays trader, okay, I'll have a chat about it. External trader to Barclays trader later that day. Dude, I owe you big time. Come over one day after work and I'm opening a bottle of Bollinger. You probably read that um, as well. I, I don't want to give the impression that kind of we think it's all about the banks and, and uh, you know, the, the, the banks going wrong. Um, there was kind of widespread complicity and, and kind of, uh, you know, mistakes uh, all round. Uh, customers have a responsibility for, for what they borrow as well. Uh, shareholders have had a heavy responsibility for, for egging banks on uh, and uh, encouraging higher returns. And you know, HSBC got a hard time for, for not doing some of the things that its competitors like uh, RBS and Barclays were doing. So shareholders are part of the picture as well. Uh, governments too. Uh, Government liked the revenues that it got from uh, from banking, um, and I think it's probably fair to say got got complacent. Uh, regulators have to uh, look to why they were ineffectual as well in in fulfilling their responsibilities. So there was lots that that went wrong, uh, and you know involving other people as well, not just the banks themselves. So um, this is what I wanted to kind of concentrate on mainly. Is kind of well, you know, what do we think? What do we think of the solutions? How how can banking be put on a more ethical footing? And I think you'll be you'll be hearing a lot about regulation uh, and the regulatory aspect of it. I, I don't really want to say too much about that. Um, you know, you've seen the FSA getting tougher recently. You've got the Financial Conduct Authority starting up, uh, talking about being tougher and bolder, uh, having new powers. Uh, for example, being able to force the withdrawal or amendment of, of, of products that are problematic. Um, you've got the Prudential Regulation, Regulatory Authority uh, looking in more detail about whether staff are fit and proper and, and whether uh, firms are safe and sound capital requirements, liquidity requirements, uh, and all of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you'll be, you'll, be hearing, you'll be hearing plenty about that. Um, and that all, that all has its place. Uh, corporate governance as well. Um, again, that, that has its place too. Uh, there, were, uh, there were real problems with, with corporate governance, uh, the ineffectiveness of, of some bank boards, um, and I think the Walker Review uh, kind of pointed to a lot of those that you had insufficient challenge on banking boards, and that's something that um, you know really really needs to be improved. Perhaps uh, board members, in, uh, non-executives, weren't devoting enough time uh, to their roles; they weren't properly supported. 
So um, all those things, all those things need to be addressed. You know, proper evaluation of boards' performance and an individual's performance on them. Uh, Walker talked about board risk committees, uh, chief risk officers, remuneration committees, supervising remuneration kind of as a whole in the bank, as well as just looking at uh, at executive directors. Uh, and Walker was very keen on uh, engaged shareholders, kind of addressing that sort of absent uh, owner or or, um, or or kind of owner that was kind of promoting the opposite of stewardship. And you've you've got things like the stewardship code, uh, trying to encourage uh, better behaviour from institutional investors. Uh, so again, corporate governance, um, that's all important as well. Uh, compliance departments are being beefed up, and they're going to have more regulations to deal with too. Um, you'll probably get annual sign-offs of kind of codes of ethics and so on, much more stringent procedures around that. Uh, it looks like there'll be more kind of professional standards uh, introduced as well um, and, you know, kind of more of a sense of, of banking as a profession, perhaps self-regulating, being able to throw people out who, who don't live up to, uh, to ethical standards. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taking that as a given, uh, and it's not actually what we find uh, most interesting. Uh, I mean, we are we're sceptical of how far that is actually going to going to take us all. Um, and if you look at, say, the Financial Conduct Authority, I think it's going to be responsible for about 24,000, 24, 24 companies. Uh, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, thousand thousand deposit taking institutions, three hundred and thirty banks. Uh, I mean the, uh, the the scale of it, and also just the um, just the the simple fact of human nature, which kind of you know we feel we know something about, is that you know you can't enforce positive behaviour. I think that's our that's our fundamental point. You're not going to get uh, positive behaviour in banking through regulation and enforcement mechanisms. And people in the church have been saying this quite a lot um, since the financial crisis. Uh, Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's just uh, uh, stepped down, uh, gave a, a lecture in uh, church on, on Wall Street, Trinity Wall Street, um, early 2010. Uh, he said, regulation alone is ill-equipped to solve our problems. The issues need to be internalised in terms of the sort of life that humans might find actively desirable and admirable. This means recovering the language of virtues. Uh, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, um, writing in a book again, 2010, a society controlled only by regulation succumbs sooner or later to our inherent drive for self-interest. Society too needs the perspective and practice of true virtue. And we, you know, we're talking about these things as well from, from some kind of personal experience. The, the previous chair of the Ethical Investment Advisory Group uh, was an investment banker, um, worked in a, in a number of firms, uh, and he wrote a, a book um, called Ethics in Investment Banking. Uh, I, I don't think there are any investment bankers uh, among you. If there were, I would highly recommend. Oh, okay. Well, I highly recommend this book. Uh, okay, highly, highly recommend. Um, the book. Yeah. Um, but I mean, one of one of one of his phrases again, I think, is you know, it's it's quite disturbing. Not necessarily unique to banking, you see it in other businesses as well, but one of the things he writes is, I have seen in general less interest from senior management in preventing abuse per se in investment banks than I am comfortable with. If a practice results in profits, it can easily, it, it can be easy to let it continue if it does not pose direct risk to the investment bank, i.e. it is not criminal, potentially loss-making, or in breach of regulatory rules, or more broadly, a regulatory risk. So, you know, an attitude that if it's profitable and you can get away with it, or it's not specifically illegal, then then that's fine. <laughs> um, and I think you know the context is that people people don't trust banks, as you know, as you will well know uh, at the moment. Uh, the annual Edelman Trust Barometer came out recently and was presented at Davos. Uh, banking is the only industry that's not seen a global recovery in trust since the financial crisis. Um, and that's not because regulation is inadequate or corporate governance is inadequate, um, you know, all these changes. Uh, it's because it's their experience that banks can't be trusted. Uh, I mean, people, aren't, people aren't stupid. Um, you know, if they don't feel that banks are actually serving their interests uh, but are serving their own, then, then they're not going to trust them. Um, which is, I guess, kind of why 
um, you know, estate agents get a bad reputation um, for, for looking after their own interests rather than uh, people that they're selling homes to. Again, the Archbishop of Westminster um, had you know, a, a good comment to make on this. Uh, if the sole motivation is to make as much money as possible out of each situation, the project of restoring trust will fail. Now, I was going to read something to you at this point, actually. I may be seeing if you could guess where it came from. Um, there is no conflict between behaving ethically and making money for our shareholders. A company that decides to drop its ethical standards may deliver more profit in the short term, but over time, the values that bind its people together will be eroded. Customer trust will be diluted, and the company's brand will be damaged. Throughout Bank X, we aspire to timeless values, integrity, trust, fairness and openness. We have articulated a set of guiding principles to bring sharper definition to what should drive our behaviour towards each other and towards our external stakeholders. These guiding principles are customer focus, winning together, best people, pioneering, trusted. I think of them as the soul of our business and we must all demonstrate them day in, day out when working for whoops, nearly said it, Bank X. I should be able to recognise them in you. You should be able to recognise them in me. I take adherence to the letter and spirit of this code and the supporting business area codes very seriously indeed. This is why we will take it and the guiding principles into account in our annual performance assessment process. Any other guesses? Is it, is it, the, is it mm. the bank that does God's work? <laughs> That's actually Barclays' old code of conduct. This is, the, this is, uh, this is Barclays' uh, code of conduct under John Varley, uh, then inherited by Bob Diamond. So it didn't really work very well. Uh, they've got a new one now, and this, this, is, what, uh, this is what Anthony Jenkins uh, was talking about. And Perhaps I should, I should have read this out, actually, and asked you to think what institution it refers to. Um, the new purpose of the bank is helping people achieve their ambitions in the right way. Uh, I couldn't tell from that that it was talking about a bank. I, mean, I, I don't know whether you could, but it doesn't seem to kind of articulate a, a purpose uh, particularly well. But anyway, it talks about values, uh, respect, integrity, uh, we act fairly, ethically and openly in all we do, service, we put our clients and customers at the centre of what we do, excellence, stewardship, um, all good stuff. But people aren't going to trust banks because of bits of paper like that, because we've had bits of paper like that uh, before. And again, talk of, talk of professional standards. Um, uh, you know, that would be great if, if there were professional standards developed in banking. Um, but again, you know, we've, we've commented on this. Uh, the Church of England put in a submission to the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. And one of the things it said on professional standards was, was this. To speak of professional standards in a culture with no internal discussion of what it might mean to be virtuous in that culture is to be part of a very attenuated and morally inadequate discourse. So, I mean, what, what um, Church of England was trying to say there was that um, it's very hard to kind of talk about professional standards and ethics if you don't actually know what a good banker is, if, you, if no one's ever defined uh, what a good banker is. So we, we think that there's a need for um, a bit of ethical literacy in banking. You know, talking of, of ethics and codes of ethics um, is all very well, but you actually need to understand ethics and be able to kind of talk about ethics and analyse things in an ethical way uh, to be able to do that. And you need to educate staff in some of these principles. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there are plenty of different ways of uh, looking at ethical issues. Uh, you know, there are three main ways, uh, looking at uh, ethics in terms of duties, uh, and they can be uh, sort of duties of behaviour, for example, not to lie and duties to stakeholders. So in the case of banking, that would be what are your duties towards shareholders, uh, clients, society, and for wider issues like, say, human rights in terms of the kind of uh, projects or companies that you're financing. Uh, another way of looking at ethics is to look at the consequences of decisions. It's called consequentialist ethics. And so you look at the potential consequences of, uh, of what you're doing. Um, 
and again that you know might have helped when looking at sort of selling CDOs uh, for example and the extent to, uh, to which you and your clients understood them and, and what was in them. And then there's, there's virtue based ethics um, and that uh, is, is about kind of ethical behaviour following from uh, kind of be behaving in a, in a virtuous way and embodying uh, certain virtues uh, and that can be virtues like uh, courage, prudence, uh, justice, uh, being trustworthy um, and you know this kind of ethical thinking is is relevant uh, for banking as well and the, um, as, as this was authored by as I say by um, the former chairman of the ethical investment advisory group but also by um, uh, someone who was actually at the St Paul's uh, Institute uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Newell founded St Paul's Institute uh, and uh, so I mean this this is about um, it's about investment banking rather than retail banking. And one of the things they tried to do in the book is kind of talk about how a code of ethics uh, may, be, may be constructed for investment banks. But I think it's, I think it's relevant for retail banking as well. So uh, what, what they say in the book is that uh, a code of ethics, to be effective, should cover all major areas of, of activity in the bank. Uh, it should include enough detailed guidance to be of practical use both to bankers themselves and to senior management and the board of directors. It should not be limited to compliance with current legislation, regulation. Uh, regu regulation lags behind banking practice. Uh, and it needs to be a helpful ethical framework to provide assistance in assessing new and changing practices. Uh, it should provide a framework for determining answers to ethical questions flexible enough to work as market conditions, products and practices change. Should be underpinned by clear, consistent and rigorous thinking on ethics. And it goes on to say, as a guide to thinking ethically, the questions uh, that might be included are uh, what values are relevant in the situation, what bearing will they have in making a decision? What rights are relevant in the situation, what bearing will they have in making a decision? Who are the relevant stakeholders and what duties are they owed? What are the likely intended or unintended consequences of taking a decision? What virtues will be developed or compromised by acting in a particular way? And they analysed uh, codes of ethics from, from a number of investment banks. Uh, and none of them go you know, any way close to, to doing this. You just don't see uh, codes of ethics like this. You, do, you don't see... Um, uh, documents that and, and training that actually enable um, people in banks to, to think in, in ethical ways in, with, with this kind of degree of literacy, or not to our, our knowledge. I'd be interested in um, in your feedback on that. So, I mean, just to just to conclude on that, the, the book says uh, a code should provide employees with information about how to identify and address ethical issues, a summary of the bank's ethical rights and duties, including shareholders and clients clear indication of expectations of behaviour, both externally and internally focused, and a list of commonly occurring ethical problems with information on how these should be handled. So, what we all think it, what, what, what we think it all boils down to, and this is one of the key points I want to make actually, is about purpose, uh, and it's about the, the purpose of banks. We think that it's absolutely essential to putting banking on a sounder ethical footing that banks have a public pur purpose. <coughs> Justin Welby is the uh, incoming Archbishop of Canterbury, um, former businessman himself. He was group treasurer at Enterprise Oil. So he knows a thing or two about business uh, and finance. Uh, in a recent lecture, he said, activity without purpose is anarchy. Uh, and he talked about wild and frantic activity in banks, I think, again, thinking largely of investment banks, uh, with no socially useful purpose. The industry was referred to as financial services, but in fact it served nothing. Now, we, we think a social purpose is necessary for all business, so again, not just uh, banking. We think that that provides kind of sustainable profitability. Um, and it's kind, of, this, it's kind of a paradox of human behaviour that to receive something, you actually have to give uh, first. Uh, that if you think in terms of how you contribute to society rather than what you can extract from society, you can actually uh, 
uh, you know, benefit uh, better in, in, in the long term for you and your stakeholders. But we think public purpose is particularly important for banks because you know, banks are, are kind of unique institutions in the economy. Uh, there's the too big to fail issue that they are they're underwritten uh, by the state and all kinds of things are going on to, to try and move away from that. But um, I think it's, it's unlikely that we're going to, to solve that problem uh, entirely. And banks are unique in that they have the ability to create money. They, they, they have uh, the right... Uh, the, the state and society give them to, to create money. Uh, and and that, brings, that brings heavy responsibilities. And again, if there are problems in banking, the state provides all kinds of support. Uh, I mean, really unbelievable support at the moment. Uh, low interest rates, quantitative easing, which have offered all kinds of opportunities for profits, uh, liquidity support. Um, and banks, banks are very bad at acknowledging this. Um, and again, I, I, mean, I don't want to pick on Barclays because they're not... They're not kind of uniquely problematic, but I think the, the argument that they make that uh, you know they've they're kind of the bank that, that hasn't needed support from from the government is just you know entirely disingenuous because there are all kinds of support um, other than, than than taking an equity stake. So we we also think that that debt is a rather kind of unique product as well, and um, it's uh, it's a potentially dangerous product as well and we think we think banks should recognize that uh, excessive debt you know, can become unmanageable to, whether that's to individuals to companies uh, or to an economy as a whole as we've seen at the moment uh, and other other industries do it they take responsibility for their products um, and we ask other industries to do it as well so we're doing a lot of work with alcohol manufacturers and retailers including supermarkets about handling their product uh, responsibly about their taking responsibility for it and possible uh, negative effects. Uh, so uh, that's, that's something that's relevant to banks. But the key thing that we think about purpose is that it provides energy and rationale for positive behaviour. Uh, as we say, you, we don't think that you can enforce uh, positive behaviour. You need to, to have uh, a rationale for it, a kind of intellectual... Um, uh, kind of concept that you can buy into uh, and if we think having a positive public purpose would support uh, useful innovation uh, in banking. There's not been a great deal of innovation uh, in, in banking really in, in recent years, certainly not <coughs> customer focused innovation. Uh, a lot of the innovation has been bank focused in terms of you know, creating some of these um, uh, either, either unsuitable or uh, uh, kind of incredibly complicated uh, products. So, I mean, the, you know, the kind of purpose that we're thinking about is, is helping people to manage their finances, having uh, a sense of duty of care for people and their finances and a, a long-term relationship with, with customers and their finances, uh, covering issues like budgeting, saving, uh, appropriate borrowing. We're thinking of things like providing services to the underbanked uh, and, again, how that might provoke uh, innovation. And again, it's something we see in other industries, uh, you know, consumer goods companies, uh, you know, someone like, say, Unilever, uh, you know, doing a, a huge amount in terms of developing products, particularly for base of the pyramid uh, consumers in, in developing uh, countries, changing, um, uh, you know, changing its product packaging size uh, and, and sort of uh, the kind of things that they offer to, to meet uh, different customer needs, needs that of, of customers that aren't at present served by them. And, and we, you know, we kind of think this process will, will generate new opportunities as well as kind of closing the doors to some business lines that, that don't have uh, a public purpose. But we wouldn't necessarily be sorry about that because uh, we think business lines that don't have a public purpose are actually the ones that you know, pose the greatest threat to a business uh, from a cultural perspective. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that you've, you've seen that in a lot of banking with in investment banking uh, infecting the, the culture of, of retail banking. Uh, remuneration absolutely has to be tackled uh, as part of this uh, and part of the process of banking being recognised more as a utility function uh, 
uh, than uh, kind of the, the racy uh, function that, uh, that it's, it's kind of aspired to in, in recent years. Uh, we've got very strong views on remuneration, which I'm happy to, to talk to you uh, about if, if you're interested. Uh, and we look at this kind of across the piece, so not, not just about banking, but um, you know, we're very sceptical about bonuses, about their, their ability to uh, actually influence behaviour. Um, very concerned about short-termism, and we think that bonuses can have a role, but they should, uh, they should reward uh, long-term behaviour, and they should re reward kind of environmental and social uh, performance as well as purely financial performance. So I think that that's really the, the main thing I wanted to, to say is that kind of, you know, we think the, the key to it all is, is a sense of purpose um, and public purpose in, in banking and that uh, a lot follows from that and a sense of the importance of virtues and kind of looking at actually what it means to be a good banker that is providing uh, a socially useful service. And that then needs to be Im embodied in, in leadership uh, and all the systems of the bank, uh, you know, appraisal systems, rewards, but you know, above all the kind of leadership examples and, and the cultural examples that you get. So I just wanted to close with a few words, uh, again from um, uh, Bishop Justin Welby. Uh, we cannot repair what was destroyed in 2008 we can only replace it with something that is dedicated to the support of human society, to the common good and solidarity. Financial services are crucial to human development, but they only do their job when the work they carry out is done in a way that is truly a service. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason why not. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of its kind of support for corporate activity then that is there's a social utility there um, I, I think you know and this is like prop trading uh, I mean I, th I think you, you know you can express real skepticism about whether that's appropriate for for a bank to get involved in I mean you know if you want to do that do it in a hedge fund and let people invest in you as a hedge fund you know wh why, why should investors in banks you know kind of be investing in a in a hedge fund by proxy uh, you know, I, I, so I don't think that is a, that is appropriate. Um, and I think investment banking, I think, is particularly difficult for conflicts of interest, uh, where you can have, you know, you're serving people on, on the same sides of, on, on different sides of a deal, or, you know, you're selling something that you may be shorting, whatever. So I think you've really got to be explicit about those conflicts of interest, really acknowledge them uh, and, and deal with them. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, as I was saying, have proper codes of ethics. But I don't think there's anything kind of, intrinsically unethical about investment banking. Uh, you know, it's an important and, and necessary function. Um, but, yeah, it's lost its way in many ways. Yeah. You've been reading Nigel Lawson today, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> he was saying RBS should be fully nationalised, wasn't he? Um, I, 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 think, I think we've got a halfway house at the moment that isn't very satisfactory. I don't, I don't think the government has kind of addressed it properly because I think, I think in some ways it's kind of it's an impediment to change because I, mean, the, I think the government's intention has always been since you know, putting its money into the banks is to get out as quickly as possible and not to do anything that kind of gets in the way of that. So I think there's, there's been a disincentive to reform because of that. Um, and yet, kind of, you know, as it's taken banks longer to recover than anyone kind of expected at the time. Um, yeah, cheers. Um, so, you know, kind of, I think government ownership is is kind of is is, is acting can, can be acting as kind of something of a of a hindrance. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that state ownership is the answer. I, mean, I don't think kind of nationalisation has has a great great track record. Really, I, th I think. I think having a purpose is an opportunity for, for a commercial business, actually, to define its purpose. And I think part of the problem with banks has been that, that you know, they've been, you know, that they risk being pushed around too much by kind of other people telling them, you know, what their purpose should be or what it shouldn't be. You know, that you've got to comply with this, you've got to comply with that. And they end up with a purpose that kind of our return on equity should be X. And it's like, that is not a purpose. And, it's, and it's, you know, it's not for us to tell banks what their purpose is. But, you know, institutions need to define their own purpose. And that way they own it, their employees own it, and, and people can kind of, 
you know, work towards it as a collective enterprise. It's got to be reduced, but I, I'm not sure you'll ever get, get rid of it, really, just because of the role that banking plays in the economy and the way its tentacles spread. Um, so I think, I think that that makes it important to have the social purpose. And I think society has a right to expect that of an industry that it supports. There's a quid pro quo. And that's what people don't like at the moment, that, you know, everything that society has given to banking, you know, uh, you know has not been acknowledged. It just, and it just seems like take, take, take. And, you know, you've got these profits on the back of quantitative easing and so on, and it's still going in bonuses. You've got fines that are being paid by the taxpayer, not by, you know, not by employees. Um, Yeah, I mean, I have some sympathy with, with, with the banks on this, actually. Um, I mean, because when we talk to banks about this, they sort of, you know, they, they say there isn't the, the same level of demand for, for lending out there. And, you know, because you're going through a deleveraging process. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, and you, you talked about the dangers of political interference. Um, yeah, I, I have some sympathy. What, what, I think what, what, what we would like to see, really, is a kind of, is a sense that part of the purpose of banks is to help the SME sector and to help develop uh, and grow it over time, you know, in ways that are appropriate for companies at a particular time. So I'm not sure kind of having a target for lending kind of, you know, this year or next year is necessarily the way of going about it. But I suppose it's just a way of articulating that, that same sense of purpose. So it's very... It's one of those issues where it's very hard for us as investors to kind of to know the truth, actually. You know, you've got government and some representative business saying one thing that they can't get the finance. You've got banks saying, well, look, you know, we're trying, but no one wants to borrow. Um, it's very hard to know, to know what the truth is, really. Well, I mean, what's your impression? Yeah. No, I've got a lot of sympathy with that. I mean, you can have unintended consequences. I mean, part of the subprime mess was because the American government, you know, was making banks lend, you know, wanted people to, to become homeowners. So... Yeah, political interference can be can be risky.